Good morning. My name is Barbara Cottrell, and I am the Public Events Coordinator for the Seniors College of Nova Scotia. On behalf of the college, I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for joining us on this, what will be a beautiful sunny morning. Today, we're joined by Nabiha Atala. Nabiha is the advisor on strategic initiatives at the Immigrant Service Association of Nova Scotia, ISANS, which is a large multi-service immigration settlement agency in Atlantic Canada. Nabiha has been in leadership roles with the agency since its beginnings over 25 years ago as MISA, the Metropolitan Immigrant Settlement Association. I'm sure some of you like me will remember MISA and look back now on how with respect to immigrants, Nova Scotia has very much changed over the years. We're extremely grateful to Nabiha for agreeing to join us this morning and tell us about newcomers who've chosen to make Nova Scotia their home. She will outline the different ways immigrants can come to Nova Scotia, the challenges they face here, and the programs and services that ISANS offers. She'll also describe the volunteer opportunities available at ISANS and the more informal ways we can all help newcomers to feel at home in Nova Scotia. If you have any questions during this uh, presentation, please write them in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And at some point, maybe he will, will uh, answer the questions. So I'd like to now welcome Nabiha. Thank you, Barbara. Um, thank you for inviting me. I'm very glad to be here with you. I always enjoy talking to people about our work. Um, the amazing things that go on at ISANS, uh, the amazing people we work with. Um, so I look forward, I wish I could see you all, <laughs> um, but uh, I look forward to this time and I hope that you will feel free to put questions in the, um, the Q&A as we go along. If I can have the first slide, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm trying to advance the slides and I'm not Just able wait a moment. to. Wait a moment. Okay. There's a problem here. I'll advance it first. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we at ISANS acknowledge that we are living and working on Mi'kmaq, the traditional ancestral territories of the Mi'kmaq people. Uh, we're grateful for the peace and friendship treaties. We are learning in our work to include immigrants, to inform them about the contributions, about the history of the Indigenous people of Nova Scotia um, who have welcomed all of us to our homes here. Our vision at ISANS is a community where all can belong and grow. And our mission is helping immigrants to build a future in Nova Scotia. I have the next slide, please. Would you like to try the slide control now, Nabia? Okay, thank you. So this is a brief outline of what I'm going to cover today. Um, here is my disclaimer. Immigration is a very complex area of work. And strictly speaking, I do not work in immigration. I work in immigrant settlement. We at ISANS are focused on helping immigrants to settle in, and build a future in Nova Scotia. We do not get involved in the immigration process. I will begin by explaining uh, definitions, statistics, and trends, and immigration categories, because that's important background and there are a lot of misconceptions that I'd like to straighten out, uh, but I do 
want to let you know that I don't know all the ins and outs of the complex details of immigration programs. Um, that will be pretty much the first half of this presentation, and then we'll move on to talking about challenges for immigrants, um, ISAN's role, and how we try to support immigrants through our various programs. And as Barbara said, what you can do and how you can be involved. Um, I should also add that the definitions, excuse me, the, well, yes, the definitions and the statistics throughout this presentation are based on 2019. Uh, given that 2020 was such an unusual year and we don't have all the statistics um, for last year anyway, the figures are all based on 2019, except for one, which I'll point out as we go along. Bowles? Yes, please. Oh, thank you for the reminder. I almost forgot that I would like to start with a little poll, um, a little quiz, as it were. If you could please choose an answer for each of these multiple choice questions. as they appear on your screen now. Just to let everyone know, the polls are taking longer than we expect because there are four separate questions. So take your time. 56% um, of you have voted already. So we'll just leave this on for uh, just a little sh while longer. So 73% of you have voted, so I will stop the voting now. And I hope That's that good. people can see the results on screen. Yes, thank you. Okay. We will cover all these issues in the next several slides, but I'll give you the answers. Um, Yes, the majority of you said 7,500 immigrants were accepted to Nova Scotia in 2019, and that is correct. The figure of 2,000, which is the second highest number, reflects the numbers we were at, I would say, in the 2000s. That was about how many people we were getting in the 2000s and perhaps into the beginning of the 2010s, but more recently, uh, we've had steady growth, and I will show you some information about that. Top three countries. Um, and again, the highest number here, it, it is true that we have had large numbers of immigrants from the UK and the US, but in fact, currently, it's China, India, and the Philippines that are the top source countries for Nova Scotia. That's been a change as well. Uh, the percentage of immigrants settled in Halifax, yes, about 80%. And what percentage of immigrants came in the refugee category? Well, in fact, 
In this case, it's only 15%. Um, and that's been quite consistent throughout the history of immigration in Canada. So thank you for participating in the polls and we'll keep moving into definitions and statistics. One of the biggest uh, confusion, oops, sorry, that went past the slide. Um, one of the biggest areas of confusion about immigration is the distinction between permanent residents and temporary residents. When I speak about immigrants, I'm referring to permanent residents, those who arrive here intending to stay. These um, newcomers are eligible for all settlement services and they have almost all the rights of Canadian citizens. They come under three major categories, economic, family and refugee, and they're sometimes called landed immigrants or immigrants. Um, but in the past little while, past 10 years, the numbers of temporary residents have risen significantly across Canada and in notably in Nova Scotia. And sometimes they are referred to by the general public as immigrants, so it becomes confusing. The term newcomers is used loosely to describe both permanent and temporary residents, but temporary residents are here on a time limited visa and they may apply to stay as they may be apply to be permanent residents, but until they get that status, they're eligible for only a few settlement services and they have more restrictions and conditions on their um, residents in Canada. So they do not have as many rights. This category includes temporary workers, international students and graduates. Those are the largest number, but it also would include visitors. It would include refugee claimants. So for the purposes of this presentation, I will be focusing mostly on permanent residents or immigrants who are the largest number of our clients at ISANS. Um, as I mentioned, immigration to Nova Scotia has been growing steadily. And if you look at the bars here, you will see that even in 2016, when of course we had so many people coming from Syria as indicated in the green portion of the bar in 2016, even if we had not had that initiative of the Syrian arrivals, you can see that immigration would have continued to increase. So we were very aware of the large number of people coming from Syria, but at the same time, the number of people in the economic category was also and has continued to grow. And we expect that when the impact of COVID is past, that we will be continuing on a steady growth trajectory for immigration to Nova Scotia. Because as I'm sure you know, we really need newcomers for our demographic situation. We are not experiencing natural growth as a province anymore. All of our growth in the population is coming from migration, whether interprovincial or international and largely international. And the province of Nova Scotia has made this a real priority and they've been very effective in increasing immigration over the last several years. Still in the larger scheme, uh, Nova Scotia receives only just over 2% of all immigrants to Canada. Many provinces look at their proportion of the Canadian population as a benchmark for immigration targets. So in Nova Scotia, we have slightly less than 3% of the population of Canada, probably something like 2.8% of the population of Canada. So we would say that we still don't receive our proportion of the immigrants to Canada. Um, when the One Nova Scotia report was uh, published about five years ago, if you remember that 
um, significant report about our economic development, the targets in there for immigration were about the numbers we got in 2019, 7,500. And that was based on what was then our proportional amount of the immigrants to Canada. So as our population and immigration grow, that target also gets a little bit higher. Uh, it's also worthwhile noting here that Manitoba and Saskatchewan are provinces with populations not much bigger than ours, but the number of immigrants they receive is significantly larger. And I think that we should take that as an encouragement that we can possibly go beyond our proportion of the immigrant of the population um, in receiving more than our proportion um, of the immigrants to Canada. There are, of course, economic and historic factors to explain that distinction. And yet, I think it's good to realize that other small provinces have managed to achieve high percentages of immigration. Um, this is the only slide, as I mentioned before, that does not is not based on 2019 figures because the publicly released statistics from the federal government only on on uh, source areas of immigrants only come through the census and not through their annual statistics. So this is the figure uh, from the 2016 census, and it shows that you can see the largest proportion of newcomers to Nova Scotia come from Asia. Um, Asia in this case would include um, many, many different countries, the Far East, the South Asia, uh, parts of what might otherwise be called the Middle East. Uh, but as you see, this is actually quite similar to the source areas for Canada as a whole. In fact, for Canada as a whole, it's probably more than 60% arriving from Asia. And this is a significant change from Nova Scotia. Uh, as many of you indicated in the poll, you were aware that we've had a high percentage of our immigration from the UK and the US. And though those numbers remain, the proportion of newcomers uh, from those countries, from those areas for us is decreasing with the increased number from Asia, especially. So most immigrants to Nova Scotia settle in Halifax. And you can see from this pie chart that the next largest proportion is other. So that means that there are immigrants scattered throughout the province in small numbers in many different communities. Not surprisingly, Cape Breton is the second largest after Halifax. Um, and New Glasgow, Truro and Kentville have notable um, arrivals in 2019. Now back to the issue of permanent versus temporary residents, just to show you how much the temporary resident category has grown in recent years. You can see the orange bar, which is international students. Nova Scotia receives a high percentage of international students considering our population as a province. But of course, that's because of the large number of post-secondary institutions that we have. And again, international student numbers, 2020 aside, are expected to continue to grow. There's a very large number of people around the world who want to come to Canada. And in fact, the international student category is the one that if people have the financial means is probably the easiest way to get here. And in both the international student category and the temporary worker category, we know that many people come hoping and intending to stay. Um, the temporary worker category 
is very close to the total number of permanent residents arriving every year. This is because many employers find the immigration process too slow and prefer to hire people temporarily because they will come more quickly. Um, you can also see that if all those temporary workers and international students were able to stay, we would quickly probably triple our immigration numbers. And both the federal and the provincial governments have acknowledged that international students and temporary workers are ideal potential immigrants because they've already had some experience of living here, either of working or studying here. They, for the most part, would have at least working knowledge of English. Um, for the international students, they should not have any issues with their credentials since they would be graduating from Canadian institutions. So they are seen as highly desirable potential permanent residents. And both governments have developed streams to bring people to allow people to transition from temporary to permanent residence. Um, in most cases, these streams require that they have a job offer first. And that is what, um, excuse me, not only a job offer, but um, that they have worked in Canada for a year before they can apply. So that is what limits, that's where the funnel is, especially for international students um, to find employment for one year before they can apply for permanent residence. So at this point, I'd like to pause and ask if there are questions. Barbara? Oh, I can see a question here that says, why is the proportion from Africa the smallest? Excellent question. Um, there are several reasons for that. Uh, on the federal level, the number of visa posts, which means the Canadian diplomatic offices through which people can apply to immigrate to Canada, uh, are, are fewer in Africa relative to the population of the continent. And many people have suggested that this is discriminatory, that there is perhaps racism involved here. There are complications that are political because of certain um, areas of conflict in Africa where the visa posts have been closed or have been moved or have been limited. At the provincial level, um, our provincial government has tended to recruit and reach out to immigrants building on previous connections. So that would mean they have reached out in Europe primarily. Um, they regularly go to recruit in uh, the UK and in Belgium and France. Um, so I think historically the largest number of African immigrants to Nova Scotia are those who have come as refugees. We have in recent years seen an increase, especially in the Nigerian community arriving as economic immigrants. And it is expected that that will grow as the country of Nigeria is growing very rapidly.
Nabia, may I ask a question? Of course. You may have answered this, but um, why is Nova Scotia's proportion uh, so much uh, lower than other provinces with our same numbers, like Manitoba and Saskatchewan? Um, I think two reasons. I think, one, uh, well, perhaps three. Um, number one, we're not very well known internationally. People across the world are not likely to have heard of Nova Scotia. Um, people around the world are more likely to have heard of large Canadian cities even than provinces. I don't think that our provincial um, system is well understood and people have heard of Toronto, Montreal and Vancouver. Um, most immigrants would seek to come to a place where they know people and as you know there are large immigrant communities in those three cities especially. Um, as well the province of Nova Scotia was not active in immigration as early as Manitoba for sure. Um, Manitoba has had a long history of taking initiative to reach out and to actively recruit immigrants and that made a difference. And they also had, they don't anymore, but they had for many years um, a benefit for people who have relatives or close friends in the province. And that would give people more points in their application to Manitoba. And that was very effective. Um, so that was a factor for Manitoba. For Saskatchewan, we saw a huge jump in immigration to Saskatchewan with the growth of the potash industry. And again, in Nova Scotia, our economy is very much based on the public sector and on primary resources. So that's a challenge in terms of the sorts of um, areas that immigrants would be looking to work in. We do know that a lot of immigrants come now to work in the IT sector and the finance sector. And those are areas in which Nova Scotia is gaining. Um, but it's, I think, a combination of historic and economic factors. Um, I can see a question of what will what impact will COVID have on our numbers in years ahead? Um, yes. Thank you for that question. It's a question we all have and we ask ourselves every day at ISENS. It's a big challenge right now to try to predict what is going to happen. Of course, because we still don't really know what's going to happen with the pandemic. We hope that with vaccination, things will return to normal, whatever that may be. Um, if you look at this slide that is still showing here for 2020, you see that we still had some immigration in 2020. And that was the permanent residents who came, who became, those who became permanent residents in 2020 were primarily temporary residents already here who applied and received permanent status. That has been the main thrust of the work of the Office of Immigration in Nova Scotia over the past year. They've continued to process applications from temporary residents because obviously um, others overseas cannot arrive. They have also been um, looking at the applications, but as you can appreciate, applications have slowed down not only because travel is restricted, but because people who are considering immigrating are now perhaps reconsidering. Do they really want to be that far from family? That's an, an important consideration. And we've seen that even in Canada, we've seen people moving back to be closer to their families when they see a new uh, reason <laughs> for being together. Um, when, when distance has been a really big challenge. 
Um, so we do hope, we know that the federal government has published higher targets in the coming year. We know that they will not, we doubt that they'll be able to achieve them right away. We do expect a sort of echo effect at the very least from the COVID crisis to limit immigration for the next several years. But when you look at those uh, international student numbers and the temporary worker numbers, that's encouraging. And I think that once we get through the next couple of years, we will see the numbers rising again, but I don't think it'll be immediate. So if those are the questions for now, perhaps we can take a break. This is a natural, oh no, excuse me, not, not yet. <laughs> I do have more before our break time. Um, I'd like to go into a little more detail about immigration categories. So another um, area of misunderstanding in the field of immigration is who is a refugee? This is the definition from the Geneva Convention used by the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. And it is the basis for our refugee system in Canada, that a refugee is a person who is outside his or her home country and has a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, which can include sexual orientation or political opinion. The most important point here is for a person to be defined as a refugee under international processes. They have to already have left their home country. Um, I'm sure you can appreciate that during the Syrian crisis, this led to great anguish for the Syrian community here as people wanted to sponsor their family members who were in the middle of that terrible war, but they could only sponsor the people who had already fled the country. And that was very difficult and it continues to be very difficult for many people that this is the definition. Another uh, very important point to make about refugees is a refugee is a person who was forced to flee from their country, period, full stop. A refugee can be um, of any level of, at any level of education, have, have had, um, only entry level positions or could be a highly trained and experienced professional. They could be fluent in English or have no English at all. A refugee is a person who was forced to flee from their country. It is true that in recent years, many of the refugees who have come to Canada have been more vulnerable. They have been people who have um, beginner language skills and who have entry level work experience. But that is a factor of world events rather than a definition of who is a refugee. And for those who remember the arrival of the former Yugoslavians in the 90s, that was a really interesting situation for us because the refugees who came from the former Yugoslavia in the late 90s were by and large highly educated professionals, most of whom had very good English skills. So I'm going to try to zoom in here to show you some of the statistics from the UNHCR. We tend to think that Canada, the US, Australia 
are the areas that receive the most refugees. But in fact, the top hosting countries in the world at this time in 2019 were Turkey, Colombia, Pakistan, Uganda, and Germany. 73% of refugees are hosted in neighboring countries, countries that do not have the resources, that cannot usually offer resettlement in the way that we do in the Western countries. So for most refugees in the world today, their situation is not what we see in those who have settled in Canada. Worldwide, under the definition I had in the previous slide, there are about 26 million refugees. There's almost double that number of internally displaced people. Those are people who, for reasons of political conflict, political issues, or environmental issues have moved, have been displaced, have been forced to move within their country. Um, internationally, there are about 4.2 million asylum seekers who are people who have left their country and gone elsewhere seeking asylum, seeking recognition as refugees. And there's a large number of Venezuelans because of the current political situation who are now refugees. In fact, the second largest number in the world after the Syrians at this point. So it's helpful to look at these UNHCR stats to get a little bit of perspective. Um, we are proud of our refugee resettlement programs in Canada and rightly so, yet we need to realize that what we do is helping a small percentage of the refugees worldwide. In the international picture, what is generally considered the first solution for refugees is to return to their own countries. So many of those who are hosted in neighboring countries are hoping to go back. Some of them do as situations change in their home countries. Being hosted in a neighboring country is considered the second best solution because it's close by, it may be more similar in culture and language. And the smallest, um, the third solution, which the smallest number of people are able to use is resettlement abroad, which is what we are doing in Canada. I'm just sorry, trying to get back to... <laughs> the regular screen here. It worked before. Hmm. There we go. Sorry about that. So, refugees within Canada. Now, this is also a little bit complex because we have three types of refugees in Canada. Government-assisted refugees are those whom we receive through the UNHCR every year. Canada has signed international agreements and negotiates every year the number of people we will receive. The federal government consults with the provinces and the provinces agree to take certain numbers of people. And on that basis, the federal government then agrees to take an overall number. Those who come to Canada have already been recognized by the UNHCR as valid refugees, and they arrive in Canada as permanent residents. They have all the rights of any other permanent resident. They are immigrants in the fullest sense. And we refer to them as refugees only in terms of the category under which they arrived, but 
because they have come from conflict, many of them have experienced trauma, we tend to continue referring to them as refugees in order to advocate for them on behalf of them because of their extra needs. So refugees are eligible for all settlement services plus. They are also supported by Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada for one year after their arrival. This is government assisted refugees in the green column here. And the government provides support at social assistance rates. They index the support they give to each province's social assistance rates. So people who arrive as government assisted refugees receive the same amount as any Nova Scotian on social assistance. And that support is provided for one year. In addition, they receive the resettlement assistance program. In Nova Scotia, that is delivered through ISANS. Across Canada, there are probably over 250 immigrant settlement agencies but only about 35 who deliver the resettlement assistance program. And so government assisted refugees are sent to places that provide the resettlement assistance program. And it is for this reason that all government assisted refugees to Nova Scotia come to Halifax because we are the only provider of the RAP program in Nova Scotia. This program is a six week program that a very intense, uh, and prescribed orientation. So we are uh, required to cover certain topics in each of the first six weeks of a person's arrival. In addition, we um, welcome government assisted refugees at the airport. We provide them with temporary accommodation. We help them to find permanent accommodation. And we provide support in life skills orientation in first language to those newly arrived government assisted refugees. I'm sure that many of you are also very familiar with the privately sponsored stream. Uh, Canada was the first country to have such a stream and following the Syrian initiative, many other countries began to ask us about our stream and the Canadian government has done presentations globally around the world uh, for other countries interested in developing a similar stream. Um, at ISANS, we often say that we would really prefer this to be called a community sponsored stream because it is based on communities. Those people who come as privately sponsored refugees also have to be recognized overseas by the UNHCR they arrive as permanent residents, again, with all those rights of any permanent resident. They are immigrants in the full sense of the word, and they're eligible for all regular settlement services. But rather than receiving the financial support through the federal government, they receive it through their private sponsorship group. And they do not, and they also receive the orientation through their private sponsorship group. So they do not receive the RAP program. Um, in general, the federal government is very aware that settlement agencies have a lot of experience in doing orientation. And so the federal government does challenge, uh, sorry, does channel the more vulnerable refugees through the government assisted stream so that they will have support from uh, a RAP provider that has been doing this for many years. Because it is difficult for a community group that is new at sponsoring to be supporting a family that might have serious health issues, no English language at all, um, disability issues. So families in those situations are directed to the government assisted stream in general. But through the private sponsorship stream, individuals in Canada can form a group to sponsor people they know. So in fact, many private sponsorship groups consist of former refugees who create a group to sponsor their family members. And they are able to identify 
um, and select whom they would like to sponsor as long as those people have already been cleared by the UNHCR and then um, they will arrive also as permanent residents. Uh, the great confusion arrive, uh, arises around the definition of refugee claimant. Elsewhere in the world, they tend to be known as asylum seekers. A refugee claimant in Canada is a person who gets here on their own and then asks for refugee status. In Canadian law, they then have to prove that they have a valid refugee claim. In the bigger picture, we do not receive many refugee claimants. Although this group receives a lot of media attention, they're not a large group in the big picture. It's very hard to get here on your own. We don't have shared borders you can walk across other than the US. Um, and it's in spite of the fact that people have managed to do it, it's extremely difficult to come here in a boat undetected and impossible to come here, pretty much impossible to come here in a plane undetected. So in fact, um, many of the temp excuse me, many of the refugee claimants um, in Canada may have already been here under temporary status. As you can imagine in situations like the Syrian crisis, there were Syrian international students here who suddenly found themselves unable to return to their country because of the war. And they were able to claim refugee status under this category. But until they've gone through that process of having their claim validated, refugee claimants are temporary residents. And at ISANS, we have very limited services for them. They are supported in Nova Scotia um, very well by the Halifax Refugee Clinic, which is an independent legal clinic set up by Lee Cohen 20 years ago. And the Halifax Refugee Clinic does support claimants in their immediate settlement and in developing their, um, their claim and taking it to the Immigration and Refugee Board. The other service that they can access is, um, and I'm sorry, I have to update this slide, the Newcomer Health Clinic, which is run by jointly by Dalhousie and by Nova Scotia Health Authority um, and was developed in partnership with ISANS in 2015. And so um, refugee claimants and other categories of um, refugees can uh, um, obtain healthcare services there. So I see that I need to move a little more quickly here. Family sponsored category, um, not a major category in, Nova, in Canada. Um, I'm sorry, I think I failed to point out in an earlier slide that about 60% of our immigrants come under the economic category uh, higher than 60% in some provinces at some periods between 60 and 70%. And so the remaining 30 and 40% is divided between the family sponsored category and the refugee categories. Family sponsored um, is also not well understood because when people hear this, they think, oh, an immigrant can sponsor any family member to come. In fact, they can only sponsor a spouse or partner, parent or grandparent, or child under 22. And I'm sure you can appreciate that for many immigrants who come from cultures where um, extended family is very important, this is a very limiting stream. Many people would love to sponsor their siblings who probably were living with them. Um, aunts, uncles, cousins, nieces, nephews are not eligible under this stream. So from an immigrant perspective, it's quite a limited uh, opportunity. And the economic category, which is the largest, is also the most complex category of immigration. 
applicants under all the various economic streams are all principal applicants are assessed. What this means is that when a family is applying for immigration, they designate one member of the family as the principal applicant. And that person completes the application and is assigned points for various qualifications they have. So points are given for skills in first, uh, excuse me, in, in our official languages, French or English. They are given for um, years of education and level of education. They're given for work experience and occupation. So under the economic categories, it is difficult for a young person to immigrate directly to Canada under these streams because for the most part, they would not be able to get enough points in the work experience category. Um, there is also an age, there are points for age, um, and I think that, if I'm not mistaken, ages 25 to 54 receive the highest points. So the major economic streams in Nova Scotia are express entry, provincial nominee, and the Atlantic immigration pilot. Um, basically, the express entry is a federal category for skilled workers and people are selected based on the points, as I just mentioned. Provincial nominee, um, every province in Canada has a provincial nominee program, which allows that province to define criteria uh, under which people will be accepted for nomination, under which the province will accept, will nominate those people as immigrants. This allows the province to target people who would meet the current labor market circumstances. So the province of Nova Scotia, for example, I will show you some of the streams under our provincial nominee program has recently targeted early childhood educators. So they would assign, they would look for people with early childhood education experience and prioritize them. Even within the provincial nominee programs, the federal government retains the right of final uh, screening for security and health. So the province can nominate people based on their criteria that they have established. And then the federal government does international security checks and does the health care checks before giving them status as immigrants. The Atlantic Immigration Pilot, uh, I believe is now actually not a pilot program, started in 2017 by the federal government in response to the provincial premier's request for support because the Atlantic does have a bigger challenge in recruiting immigrants. And so this created streams through which employers in the Atlantic can bring people and it has it been intended to give the initiative to employers so that people would come with a job offer. And it, it is also open to people already here as temporary residents. People would become immigrants on the basis of a job offer. And the employer would also work with immigrant settlement support such as ISANS to make sure that the employees have a settlement plan, which all our clients uh, work towards in their first visit to ISANS. And then the employer is responsible to follow up and to make sure that the employee is able to carry out that settlement plan. 
And so it's intended to give more responsibility to employers to increase retention by engaging employers in the bigger picture of settlement and not only in the job. Uh, this is proving to be a very successful program in terms of numbers of people who have achieved permanent resident status through it. And it is responsible for a large proportion the, of the immigration to Nova Scotia at this point. The two streams through which the largest number of people become permanent residents are the provincial nomination stream and the Atlantic immigration pilot. The other federal streams, we do not receive many people from. And that's basically because, again, people overseas don't know about Nova Scotia, um, don't hear about it on a global scale. When, when people decide to apply to Canada, they are more likely to apply through the federal streams if they know about province, other locations such as Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver. Uh, these are the current streams under the Nova Scotia nominee program. And the province has used this program effectively to provide a variety of opportunities for people to try different programs. They've opened and closed streams that were targeting certain professions. As you see, there are two streams there targeting physicians, whom we all know are in great demand here. Uh, the current labor market priority stream includes nurses, aides, uh, truck drivers, and orderlies. So where people in those occupations would not traditionally find it easy to immigrate to Canada, because Nova Scotia has identified those as high priority occupations, they can, we can nominate people with those occupations. I'd like to stop here, and I'm sorry I've gone longer than I expected to, um, but if there are questions, and then we can take a short break. Oh, I intended to click on questions and answers. There are a couple, Nabi, huh? Can yes. you read them? Or do yes, you need I can, thank you. Good. Um, the first question says, please comment on the ethics of recruiting, recruiting well-educated, well-trained workers from other countries who might need this folks, these folks at home. That's an excellent question. It's been a debate in the sector for decades. And it's one reason, in fact, that the federal government has had some ambivalence, especially with regard to international students. Um, for many years, the federal government did not officially state that we would like international students to stay and become permanent residents. Because in many cases, well, and still to this day, in cases where international students are sponsored by their national government to study overseas, we do not want to be poaching, as it were. And we want to respect those agreements that the students have with their home countries, which is a sort of return for service agreement after they complete their studies. There is a lot of concern about the, quote, best and brightest being tempted to leave. And it's unresolved, I would say. I think that in recent years, what has become a stronger argument, and it may just be primarily uh, for economic and political reasons, um, it's become a stronger argument. And that is that people should have the right to choose. That if someone wants to immigrate, they should not be limited. They should be able to choose to move. Uh, it's, a, it's an argument which many immigrants themselves would make, many international students would make. Um, it's not an easy situation to respond to. Uh, and I feel the, the challenge of that question that you have posed. And I, 
I think it's still um, a valid question for us to ask ourselves about. The, the government and the universities would say that they're recruiting people to study here. And employers would say, you know, technically still the recruitment we do um, through the temporary streams would be considered temporary. So those people are expected to go back. If they choose to stay, that's their choice. We welcome them if they choose to stay. Um, but there are, I think, other ethics, and perhaps this is what you're referring to as well, in terms of targeting highly educated people. Um, when there are a number of other considerations, such as family, uh, we at ISANS are firmly um, in favor of a more balanced proportion of the three streams of immigration. We understand that we have labor market needs, but we would like to see a larger emphasis on the family category and the refugee category. We would like to see uh, more of a, an approach that sees those as three legs of a stool of the immigration um, program in Canada. There has been a real emphasis on the economic stream, and that could be another two-hour discussion. <laughs> um, the next question says, I volunteered with a family from the Nepalese community for the past eight or nine years. They did have a community here and were happy, so I was disappointed when many, so many Nepalese moved on to Ontario. Do you have thoughts on how to retain the immigrants we do attract? Again, an excellent question. Thank you, Margaret. We at ISANS share your disappointment because that community was, uh, it was a lovely community of people and they really, um, they really had a positive attitude in their arrivals. Um, I believe that the secondary migration was initiated by the younger people in that community and they're a very uh, attached community so when some people leave everybody picked up and left pretty much. Um, retention has been a challenge for us for many, many years and uh, the provincial government's approach is to try to make sure that people have a job here when they arrive so that they will be more likely to stay. But in the big picture in Nova Scotia, we are still not competitive in terms of salaries. We still don't have as diversified an economy as some people might like. We know that our young people leave. Many of them come back, but it's an issue that we grapple with that I know our provincial government is very concerned about. And it's one place where the community has a significant role because I believe as we make people more and more welcome, that will help them to stay. And I think that while we've done an amazing job, especially in the last five years in acknowledging the benefits of diversity and in opening our hearts to newcomers, we still can build on that. I see lots more questions here below, so I will continue. What is the status of climate refugees? Where might, that's a, a very good question. Um, it is the climate refugees, in fact, is still in large part a theoretical and policy discussion at this point. It's on the radar of international groups. It has been raised nationally, primarily by refugee advocates such as the Canadian Council for Refugees. But I don't believe that there has been any change made nationally um, by the federal government in terms of acknowledging climate refugees. I'm not sure that we don't receive climate refugees because we do receive people who have had to flee because of famine. 
because of other hardships related to climate. So I think it's an area we are hearing more and more about, but it hasn't become part of the public discourse yet much. Um, thank you for thank you for your response to that. Um, so uh, I'm sorry to have spent so long. This is my biggest challenge in doing a presentation um, is keeping within the time limit. It's you're well due for a break now. If we can take five minutes and we'll come back and talk about services for immigrants and immigrant settlement. Hello again. I, I noticed during the break that I had overlooked one question. So I'd like to just begin by addressing that. And that was how can we increase what would it take to increase sponsorship of refugees? Um, this is both a federal and a provincial decision. And so I would say talking to politicians would be the first step because the province and the federal government decide the total number of refugees we will accept both under private sponsorship and under um, government assisted refugees. The provincial government you can appreciate is concerned not about the arrival because we know in that first year that private sponsorship groups do a great job of supporting the families. Uh, they are concerned about the the toll on provincial services beyond the first year. So if refugees do not find employment in the first year, they will be on social assistance. Um, the province sees it as an additional challenge and they look across all their departments and think about the increased requirements of services. For the federal government, I think that there is a, a real interest actually in increasing private sponsorship over government sponsorship. And we hope that that does not uh, get out of balance because we believe that the government should still be sponsoring and not totally relying on the community. Um, but it is essentially, I believe, ap apart from the will of people in the community to do private sponsorship, the number of refugees arriving here is a political decision that we, the community can influence by addressing our elected officials. So if I could have the next slide, please. In this next section, I'm gonna to try to move a bit more quickly so that I don't keep you here all day. Uh, and I'm sure that many of you are aware of, have thought of the challenges for immigrants. Um, one thing I'd like to point out is that we often think of language and we don't go deeper to think of communication. Um, language and communication is an issue not only for those who do not know French or English, even for those who come from countries where they have been taught English, for example, um, and, and as we have many people coming now from India and the Philippines, there are still cultural aspects of language that can be a challenge. And in the workplace, especially, those are often not recognized. Those cultural slash linguistic issues um, can be misunderstood by employers can be frustrating for immigrants. And this is something that we have tried to explain to employers more and more. And we believe is really important as more and more of our newcomers are highly skilled and highly educated. We believe that they can still benefit from some support services upfront, especially addressing cultural differences. Um, the lack of networks is obvious and probably a huge factor as well as many, many of our newcomers come from collectivist cultures where 
they really have well-developed networks that enrich their lives professionally and personally. And then our own situation here of barriers to employment because of system, systematic um, barriers, some of them being, I think, related to racism and discrimination, others just short-sightedness, um, not understanding how to make the path easier for newcomers. So moving on, I would like to tell you now more about ISANS and how we try to support immigrants. My slide is not advancing. Thank you. I will have to refer you to our website for more detailed information because of the time crunch here. But uh, you may know we celebrated our 40th anniversary last year, that's in um, 2020. And we have now almost 300 staff at ISANS. I'm still boggled by that number. I, when I joined uh, MISA, I was the 12th person in 1996 to join the staff there. But we merged with the Halifax Immigrant Learning Center in 2009 and um, have just continued to grow since then. Our staff are very diverse, coming from over 60 different countries. And that's one of the things that makes ISANS an amazing place to work. Um, we have continued to deliver services, all of our services, pretty well um, throughout COVID. All of us are still working, although our roles may have changed slightly, we never shut down. It was a big challenge to deal with COVID, especially for our vulnerable clients. And although this won't be part of my presentation, um, we do continue to um, try to address the challenges presented by mostly online service at this point. Um, our areas of work include settlement in Nova Scotia, that's orientation to living in the province, learning language, and uh, finding employment are the two areas of uh, in greatest demand in our services. We support immigrant entrepreneurs in starting and maintaining businesses. We support employers in diversifying their workplaces and in gaining greater cultural understanding to retain employees who come from international backgrounds. And we try to connect our clients with the community. And we feel this is an important part of retention um, through various recreation, community events, and our volunteer programs, which I will tell you about. So this is our website, isands.ca. Please go and check it out. There will be lots of information there. Uh, we're actually undergoing a redesign of the website. So keep checking it out because in a couple of months, it will look a little bit different. In 2019 to 2020, here are some of our numbers. Over 10,000 clients, almost 750 active, trained, engaged volunteers, um, many, many visits to the office, visits to our website, calls to our office, and 33,000 volunteer hours. We cannot do our work without volunteers. Of the 10,000 clients, about 4,423 were new to us. Um, in our settlement services, a lot of the work is with refugees being supported in their first year of settlement. ISANS is also a sponsorship agreement holder, which means that we support private sponsorship groups. We're one of about seven sponsorship agreement holders in the province of Nova Scotia. And so groups can sponsor privately through us. Um, and we provide support in family um, concerns. It's a big change uh, in culture <clears throat> to be a parent 
in Canada as opposed to being a parent in other places. And we have been able to deliver uh, programs which are delivered also provincially uh, known as the Incredible Years and Handle with Care. And we have parenting support groups to help orient parents to what it means to raise kids here and what assumptions there are and to help people to integrate their parenting skills with the approaches they'll see around them and the influences on their children in this society. Our language programs um, span everything from literacy, teaching people who cannot read and write in their first language, to profession-specific communication courses such as English for um, internationally educated physicians or engineers or accountants and everything in between. This is our uh, largest area of work with over 4,000 people participating in our programs face-to-face -face and online. Employment is also a huge area of work and concern. And as in our language programs, we work with a wide range of clients, those who have never had jobs outside the home to those who have years of experience um, in a highly skilled and specialized field. We do work with people on international qualifications recognition, which I'm sure you realize is a is a huge issue for immigrants across Canada. And we work through 13 profession-specific multi-stakeholder working groups to clarify pathways to licensure and create supports where needed for immigrant professionals. Uh, we also provide bridging programs for people in the trades, um, in entry-level work, and as in all of our programs, our approach is one of empowerment. We ask our clients to identify their goals and we help them to map out the pathways to reaching their goals. They are in charge and we are consultants, supporters, uh, informants, trainers, but they are leading their own pathway to their goals. Working with employers um, has, is an area that has grown rapidly um, in our work, as many, many employers are seeking to fill gaps and also to diversify their workforce. Um, we have many volunteers who support this work, and I'll give you some more specific examples later. Um, we have four positions in smaller communities in Nova Scotia that primarily support employers in those areas, which are Truro, Kentville, Yarmouth, and Bridgewater. Um, and we provide workplace culture workshops. Our immigrant business support programs have been in place uh, for many years, since the mid-1990s. And I'm sure you're aware that there are a lot of immigrant-owned businesses in Nova Scotia. Uh, we support both those who are starting and those who are trying to maintain their businesses. And we have an app which you can download called the Marketplace, iSense Marketplace app, where you can find immigrant businesses in Nova Scotia immigrant-owned businesses in Nova Scotia. And connecting with the community is a very important aspect that is also, I believe, growing quite rapidly in our work. Um, we have community gardens where many, especially senior clients are very happily occupied on a regular basis in five locations across Halifax. We have many partnerships and we provide a lot of support for families to engage in recreation because we feel that's a very important part of integration and retention. Uh, finding ways 
to relieve stress, finding ways to meet long-term Canadians, to engage in the community, uh, to enjoy their favorite sports or hobbies or develop new recreation um, skills. And there are skills involved and we, we do between our um, community connections and our settlement team provide programs such as orientation to winter and how to enjoy winter. Um, ISANS has been developing and delivering distance and online services for almost 20 years now. We were a pioneer across Canada in online delivery. We have clients in over 400, in almost 500 different locations around the world who are primarily accessing language and pre-employment programs. Um, in Nova Scotia, we have clients in over 100 communities who take our programs online. And as you can imagine, now this year, everybody has gone online. It's been very um, encouraging for us to see how we were able to expand our programs quickly because of all the work we've done online in the past and the experience we have in this area. And we expect that the proportion of online services will continue to be high even as we return to in-person services um, with the resumption plan following the lead of public health. We expect that some people will choose to access our services online even if they're in Halifax. Uh, and a, an important part of our online work is pre-arrival services so that those who come can arrive prepared. Now, what you can do. There are lots and lots of volunteer opportunities at ISANS, and those um, have continued as much as possible throughout the pandemic. I'm going to focus on four roles that are needed right now, but in general, everybody can participate in welcoming newcomers. You are already taking a step by attending this session because an important part of welcoming people is learning about different cultures. And we would strongly encourage people to diversify news sources. We really get very little international news um, in Nova Scotia. And there's a lot going on in the world that is the cause for immigration that is impacting immigrants every day. Um, and having a global perspective really helps to welcome newcomers and learn from them. Um, we also provide intercultural awareness sessions and would encourage you to participate in those if you'd like. Um, learning can be done in so many different ways and I'm sure that many of you have ideas beyond what we have as well. Um, there are many, many ways to engage from supporting the local businesses run by immigrants to simply challenging, well, simply is not always simple, challenging racist remarks that we encounter. Um, and volunteering is perhaps the most hands-on way that you can support newcomers. Um, I'm sorry to have to rush through this. Uh, there are more, there's more information on our website. I'm sure that many of you who are on this call are already engaged as uh, the person who asked a question earlier. And if you are not, I hope that you'll consider it. Um, ISANS volunteers are involved in almost all our programs. We have 14 distinct roles for volunteers not all of which are active right now because of the pandemic, um, but all our volunteers receive orientation, training and support and must complete a criminal record check for vulnerable populations and reference checks. So the four opportunities that 
are open right now where we really need support are in our Canada Connects program, in the newest rec uh, support role, which is Recreation Navigator, in our English as an Additional Language one-on-one -on -one tutor and conversation circles, and as practice interviewers. And I will describe each of these roles. For all of them, the first step would be to complete an online application on our website. And once you have completed an application, then you can sign up for a general orientation session where our volunteer coordinator will explain all that's involved. And then you can choose the particular role you would like to fill. So the Canada Connects program matches newly arrived immigrant families with individuals and or families here to meet once or twice a week for a minimum of six months. And really this is building a friendship and helping people to make their way around the community. This has continued online and is available as online program right now and hopefully will open up again as the province opens up. We try to match volunteers with clients who have some similar interests of the same gender, um, perhaps have families with children the same age. Um, this can be done as an individual family to family or particularly with a focus on those 55 plus. Recreation Navigator is our newest role, and this is to help families um, understand the opportunities and sign up for programs. This is uh, pretty much an online process right now. Most all of the recreation opportunities in Nova Scotia require an online application, which is more challenging for newcomers. So supporting that registration process is a big part of this role, helping people to understand uh, what the different programs are. Hopefully soon visiting community uh, recreation centers with a newcomer, um, showing them around a library a trail, a playground, helping them with bus and community orientation, and basically helping them understand the recreation system. This is one that uh, a role that has just opened up that we are hoping will attract people so that more immigrants can take advantage of recreation programs this summer, which again, we are hoping will be in person. The EAL one-on-one -on -one tutor and conversation circles are very valuable complementary services to formal language classes. You do not need to have experience in teaching as we provide resources and training, but people really need the opportunity to practice their language skills informally, either one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. And this is generally once a week for two hours. We have continued this online and I wanted to show you this uh, screenshot of an online group with our volunteer Mark at the top right um, and his small conversation group which has continued to meet. Um, this is a really important part of language learning as it's generally the informal, the day-to-day, -day, the friendlier language that is important because even when immigrants have mastered the more official language related to their work, they may not know what to chat about in the lunchroom with colleagues. And we've often heard that. The practice interviewer role is another one that is really uh, recruiting actively right now for this summer. When we support people, in their job search, we have learned how much our interviews in Canada are culture specific and what a challenge this is for newcomers. Many, many, many countries do not require interviews as part of the job search process. And it's quite a daunting task for newcomers, even if they are highly skilled in their fields. So 
we set up practice interviews. We generally look for volunteers from the same field as the client who is in need of practice. So we start with client, the fields that clients um, are searching in. We look for people who have HR or administration backgrounds who would understand the hiring process. And what we do is set up a practice interview that is taped and then is reviewed by both the client and the volunteer so that they can then provide feedback. For example, in question number three, when I look at your resume, you could have added this information. Or in question number four, you went off track, you should have saved that information for another question and listen more closely to the focus of that question. That's the sort of feedback that is very helpful. And this is an incredible opportunity for newcomers to build their confidence to be able to go into an interview. You see here on the screen, our volunteer Ken Spurian, uh, who's the small figure at the top, coaching uh, internationally educated engineer, Sergei Sarnavsky. Um, who is currently applying for work in Nova Scotia. And we do have a need right now for people who have worked in government at either municipal, provincial, or federal levels to assist with government interviews and help assess candidates' readiness for the Federal Internship for Newcomers program. This is a uh, federal program that is coming up this summer where people will be um, supported for positions in government if they are successful in the interview process. So if you are interested in volunteering, especially in any of these four roles, please go to isans.ca. One of the tabs at the top of the screen is volunteer and that will take you straight to the page where you will find the online application once that is completed, you'll be invited to an orientation session and then you can identify the role you'd like to play and you'll be linked right away with the coordinator for that program. Um, I really hope that many of you will take advantage of this opportunity to connect with newcomers and support them because I'm sure that in this group I'm speaking to, there are huge um, abilities and intent and concern and that you have all the qualifications needed to be wonderful volunteers and help make this a more welcoming place for newcomers. That's the end of my presentation. Um, I see that there are some more questions, so I will look at those. Could you comment on the treatment of migrant workers, especially on farms? It seems akin to a modern day slave trade, letting people do the essential work, but giving them limited rights and protections. What supports are available to migrant workers in Nova Scotia and how can one get involved to support this group? I am in the Annapolis Valley and I'm interested in getting involved somehow. Wonderful, thank you, Judy. Yes, um, I can see from all these questions that those of you who are asking for questions are, um, are people who have already thought about these issues. And you're very right, Judy. Um, migrant workers are a large number, about a thousand at least in Nova Scotia every year. Again, they fall outside the group that we are mandated to serve at ISANS. So we don't directly have supports for them. Um, and I would have to get back to you about a contact. Um, if you would like to email me, um, I will put my email in the chat. I believe you can all see the chat. Um, I can look into who would be a contact for supporting migrant workers in Nova Scotia. It's an issue across Canada for sure. Um, and I think one that we have not addressed very much in Nova Scotia. 
interesting to know through the pandemic, our migrant workers were still admitted, which shows that we really need them. But it's true that many of their rights are not established. Um, is volunteering only for HRM or beyond? I believe it is beyond, um, and it probably depends on each role. Please um, do check out our volunteer opportunities and um, on the web page, you can find, I believe, the email of the volunteer coordinator if you want to specifically direct that question to her. A new resident once told me that she felt welcome and helped in ISANS and library programs, but missed very much the feeling of having a friend to have coffee with, etc. Yes. Yes, and this is where we need our volunteers. And that's what the Canada Connects program is. It's having that person to whom to go and have a cup of coffee with, with whom to go and have a cup of coffee. Um, often the, those volunteers uh, become informants in a way that we as staff don't because people tend to, uh, our programs are specific and we, focus on specific needs and it doesn't somehow come up um, if somebody has a more general personal question so a new friend is really really a valuable support to any immigrant um, i think that this has been a huge benefit of our canada connects program and I would really encourage any of you who are interested in being that new friend to sign up for that. Uh, yes, this presentation is going to be available as a recording, I believe, on the SCANS website. Uh, and I do not see any more questions. Um, I will put my email here in the chat. Oh, I, sorry. Here we go. And this is the formula for all of us at ISANS. First initial, last name at isans.ca. Uh, if you know the name of a staff person at ISANS, you can always email them. Thank you for your feedback on the presentation. I wish there could have been more interaction. I wish we were in person and I could see your faces. Um, but I really always enjoy knowing that there are people interested in the work that we do, interested in supporting immigrants and you are a very key part of our retaining immigrants in this province. Thank you for your interest and thank you for your questions. Oh, thank you so much, Nabiha. That was an excellent presentation. I have learned a great deal. I'm always amazed by how, I, how much I don't know I don't know. And I'm still pondering refugees who can't apply for refugee status until they've left their country. I mean, there's just so much in what you've just told us. Um, thank you to everybody for your very interesting questions. And I hope that uh, some of you will in fact volunteer with uh, ISANS. Um, before we leave today, I'd like to thank our wonderful crew, Bob Russell and Bill Lee, for the terrific work they, they are doing with Zoom. And thank you all for joining us. Um, we hope you'll join us again for our next lecture, which is coming in November. And please check out the SCANS website for our full courses, which will be posted soon. So thank you again, everybody. And uh, Nabiha, our thanks to you. My pleasure.